that's how I got to actually know about R, is through the Hadleyverse, as people call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably most famous for ggplot, if not dplyr. Mm -hmm. uh, of those packages, is there anything in particular that you're really particularly proud of? It's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think, like, to me, the thing that gets me most excited is this sort of, like, I, I see this vision of how data analysis should be and how you can, how I can help people do data analysis where they don't have to fight the tools. It just naturally helps them solve the problems that they're interested in. And I'm like, that that what gets me really excited and, and is just seeing what people do with it. Like I love the ggplot2 mailing list. It's like such a fantastic resource and like on Stack Overflow there's just so many people like helping other people use the tools I've created. It's tremendously satisfying. Internationally. I mean yes. when you go to Stack <laughs> Overflow it's, it's incredible. I mean it's uh -huh. a United Nations of people trying to analyze and understand data. Um, so on that point, though, so you're, you're opinionated. You have an opinion mm -hmm. about how it is that the entire process should be managed. Yep. Where did you develop that opinion? It, it was really, it's, it's sort of really interesting. Like I, when I started my PhD at Iowa State, I taught a couple of R courses for a company and they kind of like provided a curriculum. And looking back, I looked back on those slides a few years ago and it made me realize like all of the bits that I thought were particularly frustrating and didn't have any nice underlying theory, like things I ended up working on. Um, and the other thing that was really influential is at Iowa State, my assistantship for my PhD was doing consulting, so I'd help PhD students um, with their statistics problems. So I sort of had like, you know, two of working on two or three different small statistics problems every week. And that just made me like realize how much of the problem of doing statistics is not like the statistics itself. It's getting the data in, getting in the right form, visualizing it so you get some idea, and then like the, the final model is often like the easiest part of the process. Yeah, no, when, when I'm programming in R, that's one thing I notice is that 90% of the code is getting the data to the point where I can do something useful with it. Um, a lot of what you're doing with your modules and with your code I almost see as a domain-specific language mm -hmm. for different facets of the data process. Yep. Yep. Uh, it kind, it's kind of funny to me, you almost seem to use R as a runtime environment yep. upon which yep. to build your domain-specific yep. language. Is that a conscious decision? Yeah, very much so. Like, I, I kind of, like, I think, like, one of the things I like about R is because it is such a host, great host environment for domain-specific languages, and I think there's a lot of like data analysis that you can tackle with this sort of domain specific algebra, a domain specific language or an algebra or a grammar, like where you think about what are the component pieces and how do you join them together. And I really like this, this approach to solving problems where you, you have like very, very simple building blocks. You have a way of um, combining them together and then that, each piece is easy to understand by itself but you can join them together into something very complex and flexible that allows you to, to solve a lot of problems. And, and, but, but equally, like you don't want to try and solve every problem. If you try and solve every problem, then the domain-specific language is not, doesn't really help you. It's not a it's domain. Complex. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and so equally, like, I think something that makes you know, like dplyr and, and reshape or tidyr and, and ggplot successful is because I can capture like the most common 80% of tasks, but for the other 20%, you can do anything. You know, you've, you're in a programming language. There's thousands of other packages you can use, and, and that makes it possible because I can rely on that. Because I can rely on you know thousands of other people's work, and to to, to, to handle this kind of massive long tail. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of tech, try and focus on like what are the most common problems that the vast majority of people using R experience. Okay. That makes sense. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting you just said is that you said that R is specifically a great environment for hosting domain-specific mm -hmm. languages. You're writing a, a fantastic book right now, Thanks. The Advanced R Programming. It, uh, I mean, it, it's clearly an advanced book. Mm -hmm. It is not an, in, you know, it's not an introduction. Yep. And in it, you tackle the, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the term, the non-standard evaluation. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, coming from a traditional computer background, computer science background, non-standard evaluation was a great surprise to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you use it a great deal. Yeah. Uh, so 
that's probably one of the features that you would point to as one of your favorite features of R. Yeah. Can you talk to me about what are some aspects of R that set it aside, set it apart? What are your favorite bits? I mean, I, I, I think it's interesting that it is an extremely fixable language. And if you're a programmer coming from another language and you can kind of see, like, you, you can take an object, an S3 object, and you can change it to an arbitrary class, you're like, oh. You know, that, that's horrible. It's wrong. <laughs> but I kind of think like most, the way I sort of think of it is like, you know, many, like programming languages kind of provide contracts, right? These are the things you can do. These are the things you can't do. And in many programming languages, that's kind of like a legal contract. It spells out explicitly like what you can and you cannot do. And the things you can't do, there's, there's no way you can do them. It's oftentimes seen as a feature of the language. Yes, exactly. Whereas R, it's more like a contract between friends. Like you're, you're kind of like, you know, you really shouldn't do this. But if you really want to, you know, you can go ahead and do it anyway. So there's a lot of things that... Um, you know, they're not great programming practice and you don't want to do them 95% of the time, but the 5% yeah. of the time that you need them, that, that's really, really useful. And I think there's a lot of parallels between like R and C++. Like C++ is an incredibly powerful programming language. You can do, you know, all sorts of crazy and dangerous and bad things yeah. with it. And that's used as a, and people use that as a reason not to use it. But you can also write, you know, C++ code that's relatively simple and understandable and you just keep these kind of the crazy magic constrained to a well-defined area and then you could take advantage of the simplicity 95% of the time but you can still always escape the constraints mm -hmm. and do what you really want to the other 5% of the time. Uh, so ggplot is this fantastic tool that allows for visualization mm -hmm. but well ggplot too. Uh, you've recently uh, started talking a great deal about ggviz. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain to me sort of the cognitive model and the evolution in your understanding of visualization that has taken you from ggplot to, to ggviz? So I think there's kind of one like general trend and that is like everything is moving to the web. Like anything that can move to the web will move to the web. And generally like when you look at kind of cross-platform graphics rendering systems there's so much work going on in browsers and making them fast and competing and, and it, it just if you want to do like cross-platform interactive graphics like the, the bread it's so clear that the browser is where you yeah. want to be and I've worked on um, other projects in the past like um, a Gigobi and our package called Cranvis which you know, work at quite a low level with like the, the graphic system on the, the computer. The, the challenge, those are like incredibly, incredibly fast, but the challenge is like getting everything compiling on every possible system yeah. so that you can easily use it on your computer. And, and, and certainly like that kind of stuff is great for like special purpose where you're willing to invest time in getting the software up and running. But, you know, if, if you can't, from my perspective, if you can't download a package from CRAN and start using it right away, then that's too hard for most people. And so the, those sort of things, like that, those sort of intersections, like the web graphics are not necessarily fast, although they're getting faster all the time, um, but they're so much easier to distribute. And, and with, you know, sort of the, the, the integration of GGVis and Shiny and the ability to, like, host the arbitrary visualizations that use arbitrary R code, so you, though the, the, somewhere a server has to be running R, yeah, but <laughs> most people can just look at it from their web browser, they can use it on their iPad, the iPhone, whatever, and they can just use that visualization without having to understand or what, care about what's on the back end. So you, I believe your title is Chief Scientist? Yes. At our, at our studio. Uh, it's a pretty cool sounding title. Yes. Uh, you know, so uh, our studio is pushing sort of this move to the web to a degree. Yes. Does, what's your job like uh, at our studio as the chief scientist and does it basically involve this entire motion towards the web? To some extent, I mean, I, my position at our studio is kind of a research and development position. I, I, I sort of think of like my job is to make R more awesome. Cool. So, you know, I don't have any responsibility to, 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 to sell R studio or to make R studio better, but, you know, obviously the better R is, the more people use R, the more people use R studio, the more people use our commercial products. Um, I mean, one, I think, as a company, like, we're definitely, like, so heavily invested in the web. 
I mean, one thing that you, you don't notice with the R Studio IDE and that the R Studio IDE is just, it's all HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And that's why you, know, you can use R Studio server remotely and you just connect it through a web browser and it looks exactly the same yeah. as when you use the IDE. And that's because the local IDE is basically just a bundled web browser that views the, the R Studio web application. And I, and I think that that's really cool and that gives us a lot of capability to embed arbitrary web components inside the IDE and we've started to see that with the viewer pane. Yeah. Um, I just saw some nice integration, very beta stuff in terms of displaying our markdown documents in the pane so you can see them alongside the document you're editing. You know, because it's just a web browser, you can stick arbitrary HTML anywhere in the iStudio IDE and I think we've only just started to explore what that means. So that's a pretty smart architectural decision. There's so much money and effort going into hardware accelerated canvases mm -hmm. and all of these technologies, you know, faster DOM, that you guys are just going to be able to piggyback on that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so if your position is a research and development position, that gives you some leeway to think about bigger pictures. Yeah. Um, what are the bigger picture challenges that you think are you're going to be working on in the next couple of years? So I think in the short term, it's just getting this like pipeline of data analysis from like loading your data, tidying your data, visualizing your, uh, manipulating your data, and visualizing da your data, and just making sure like every piece fits together, have a consistent interface, it, it's fast. Um, you know, one of the things that's had a profound impact on my development of tools is RCBP and being able to write C++ code that's really nice, uh, really fast. And just so, so just like getting that pipeline from raw data to a visualization absolutely solid is something that like in the short term I'm working on heavily. I think in the longer term, um, I, I mean the, 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 the one thing that kind of my, the Hadleyverse doesn't really tackle at all at the moment is modeling. Mm -hmm. And there's, the, you know, there's obviously a huge amount of, of really great modeling software in R and implementing every model you can possibly imagine. But to me, there's still a lot that, that, that the model building process, that iteration where you like fit a model, you look at, you look at, you plot it somehow, you look at the residuals, you look at predictions, and then use that to inform the, the next visualization. That, that currently feels kind of clunky to me. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I'd like to think about how can we build better tools for that. Um, and, and then I think generally the, the other shift, I think, is sort of looking at like big data mm -hmm. um, and my my sort of impression of where the field is going is that by and large most data scientists will not have to worry about that exactly what, what, what will happen is you will buy some kind of analytics database which will be like a cluster of computers they have shared memory the main interface to it is SQL um, but also embedded in that database will be a number of kind of the, the most common and most important modeling tools. So R is, is and always will be like an unparalleled environment for exploratory analysis of your data, but it's, it's, it's fundamentally all about in-memory data. Yeah. And, and I think that's right. And there's a lot of things you can do with in-memory data you can't do with out-of-memory data. Yeah. You, you can never get that like really fluid exploration. So, so like I think like broader, there's this, there's this iteration between like you getting some subset of the data, whether it's like an aggregate or a sample or a, a summary into R, you do some exploration, then you want to talk to the, the system that has all of the data and ask it to do something more sophisticated. Maybe it's going to fit linear models or random forests or support vector machines or something and then get the result of those, pull them back into R, introspect them, use that to inform kind of the next step and, and so on and so on. And, and so, so like, you know, there's some baby steps in that direction with dplyr, which can talk to databases and mm -hmm. translate your R expressions into, into SQL so that you don't have this, this big cognitive cost of switching languages, yeah. which is really, really painful. Um, you know, not because R and SQL are so different, but because they're so similar, except there's like a few right. really frustrating differences. Right. It, it would almost be better if they genuinely were different. Yes, yes, definitely. So, uh, one of the things that, so the first time I was exposed to R was during uh, my wife's doctoral dissertation. Mm -hmm. She actually taught, what I think, one of the first classes using R Studio mm -hmm. at the university level, two mm -hmm. months after R Studio was released. She taught uh -huh. a doctoral statistics class. And when I saw R coming from 30 years of computer programming, mm -hmm. 
I was genuinely horrified. Yeah. It was like, you, there's no dynamic memory allocation, there's yeah. no, it didn't fit. And one of the things that was hard for me to understand was that computer programming isn't necessarily software engineering. Yeah. And it was only once I actually began to understand this entire interactive method, mm -hmm. this idea mm -hmm. of a loaded environment with memory, with data, and the programmer, the data scientist, mm -hmm. actually actively working in the REPL loop, yeah. that yeah. I saw the value of R. Yeah. So it sounds like you believe that that's going to be how data scientists continue working in the future, yeah, in I've, this sort of interactive exploratory absolutely, method. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think R is really interesting because there's sort of a, a tension between R as an environment for interactive data analysis, where basically you want to be able to iterate as quickly as possible. It can sort of do some magic to guess what you want. If it guesses wrong, you know, you find out right away because you're always looking at your data. But then there's also R as a programming language where you want everything to be like explicit, you want things to fail right away, to never guess if, if something doesn't match up quite right, it should say, I don't know what's going on, I'm going to try and fix it for you, I'm going to throw an error. And, and that, like I found that thinking about that tension really helpful, like some functions are designed to be used interactively, some functions are designed to be used by other programmers, yep. and you want to do things a little bit differently in those, in those two environments. And I, and and and, uh, but but the majority of people using R are not programmers, or they right. don't. At least they don't self-identify as programmers, even though they are doing They're programming, programming. And scripting. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that is, like I think generally, we're going to see a lot more of that. Like that 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 sort of programming is such an incredibly important skill for almost I anyone in any facet of life, regardless of you know, whether you want to be a historian or you want to be a, a scientist or a, you know, whatever, you, you need to have these computing tools that allow you to you know, explore data or explore your domain without having to have this you know, hardcore programming background, without having to understand like, memory allocation, how computers yeah. work on a fundamental level. And, and I think that like to me like the combination of kind of computing and, and data is sort of transformative like that it's it's a really powerful motivation to learn computing and, and sort of my experience is it's so much fun like to teach a course about computing where you basically start with visualization you just throw yeah. people in the deep end like this is how you can create plots and it's, it's such a it's so motivating because now you can take a data set and start to understand what's going on yeah. What you're saying really resonates with me. I have a 13-year-old son mm -hmm. who has been exposed to me as a programmer the whole time. Mm -hmm. And he's never shown really any interest. Because it looks boring when you're yep. in VI yep. writing some Perl code. Yep. That's not going to motivate a 13-year-old. Yep. Something happened when I shifted from that kind of programming to more data scientist mm -hmm. programming that suddenly my son would come up to me and ask me questions. Mm -hmm. He would point at things and what really shocked me is that every once in a while he would bring an insight mm -hmm. that I genuinely yeah. had overlooked. Yeah. No, th so there's something to what you're saying about this idea that this exploratory programming, this exploratory paradigm mm -hmm. is going to be transformative. Um, do you think the tools are there? Are we? Where are we on the evolution? I think we're still fairly early days. You know, I mean, R has a 30-year history, yeah. basically. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, mistakes that have been made that cannot be unmade. It, the, the challenge is, though, like, there's kind of only, eat, like, there's only bad solutions. Like, you can, if you start afresh, if you start with a new programming language, like Julia, which like is Julia. clearly, a, like, a fantastic programming language. For programmers, it's amazing. But there's no, like, there's no, none of the, the packages you need to do data analysis are there. And it's going to take, it takes a long time for a, a new language to catch up like that. And I think Julia's, you know, doing really well at building a, a community around that. But so that, that's one choice, is to kind of start afresh, and then you have to start from scratch, which is both good and bad. On the other hand, and sort of more what I'm doing is like, how far can we, can we push R? How far can we take it? How can we make it a, a terribly flexible language? You know, how can we help people use the good parts of it and avoid the, avoid the bad parts? And I think we've seen this sort of a similar 
evolution with JavaScript. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's this, this famous book by Douglas Crock called JavaScript, The Good Parts. Like, you can take a programming language that people think is horrible and awful, and you can scope out the nice part of it and teach people to do that and use that and, and effectively kind of create a new style of programming in that language. JavaScript was considered a toy. Mm -hmm. And I'm relatively new to the R community, but R was considered the domain of pure academics. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, the parallel is, is, is really there. Um, I want to talk for a second about, a, about API design and software design. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sat in your dplyr talk yesterday. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me is that, so dplyr is completely written in C++, is that correct? Um, mostly? mostly. So it was interesting because from a software engineering standpoint, you're now flipping things upside down a little and you're using the R you're calling into R as an API, and you've built your own mini runtime mm -hmm. you know, for dplyr. Yeah. yeah. Um, are you having to fight R for that? Is it is? It... It, it's not too bad. I mean, I think the, the, that's just sort of the interesting thing about like domain-specific languages. Like once you've kind of embedded them, and you have like sort of a some, not there's a terribly formal specification, but there's some specification of what that language is then it's, it's much easier to convert that to, to multiple different backends. And you know, that's a deep layer. If you're working with a data frame that's all C++ code that Romain Francois has written, if you're working with a database and it's translated to SQL and that runs on the, the but, but that, that ability because you've got this kind of, this, this language that is limited in scope, it's much easier to translate that to efficient C++ code or to SQL than to say, well, take all of R and make that efficient. Like, that's, a, that's a big challenge. So a lot of what you do is you build abstractions, mm -hmm. uh, as far as I can tell. That yes. seems to be a lot yep. of what you do. So one of the critiques of abstractions is that all abstractions are leaky. Yep. Uh, so for dplyr uh, in particular, uh, we spoke yesterday about a range. Yep. A range does not take into account the locale ordering yeah. inside of R. Yeah. And I actually was thinking about it last night, and I thought I could take some dplyr code, and sorting a data frame would sort one way, but if my backend was a database, mm -hmm. and that database had its own locale set yeah. settings, the arrange would actually come back different. Yep. Uh, so I'm curious, as a software engineer, as a software developer, you have some tools and methods that you're using to sort of manage these leaky abstractions. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about what does your environment look like? What tools do you use to manage these abstractions and just to manage your regular workflow as a developer? That's a possibly difficult question to answer, but <laughs> so certainly like my, my everyday tools are easy to answer. I mean, that's our studio, which honestly I've only really started using seriously in the last 18 months. Um, what did you use before then? I used um, Sublime Text 2 and the terminal and just copying and pasting stuff okay. between them. The old-fashioned way. Yep. Um, and it certainly helps having like the air of other, of the, the air of our studio developers when there's features that I would really like in our yeah. studio. Um, but I mean, our studio, I think the like our studio projects have sort of have been incredibly useful for me and I often have like, you know, four or five R studio projects running simultaneously. Um, Git, uh, I think unit like unit testing has been really important for me. Like once you once I get to the point where I don't really understand how things work anymore, it's really nice to have unit tests so we don't accidentally break things. Uh, you know, I also I do spend quite a lot of time just kind of like thinking about how the way things should work and kind of like writing up little kind of examples of of code and the output, how it should work, and sort of thinking through all the combinations. Um, and you know some of that, that that that's mostly on the computer now, but I will still sometimes sketch things out on pen and paper. That's just easier. Uh, Do you use Knitter? Uh, yes, for that, I guess that's an, another big change is that I like all my vignettes are now in R Markdown. In fact, I don't think I, I, I don't think I ever wrote a Swee vignette, but I've now written at least like. 15 R Markdown vignettes of various sizes. I just find R Markdown so much easier to write in because you don't have to worry. Again, it's like this constraint. Like, I, I can't worry about all this fancy formatting, so I, I don't. Like, yeah. I, that, 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 then that's the beauty of R Markdown. Markdown, Markdown. is a domain specific language. Yeah. 
it's the same exact thing. They've winnowed down the things you have to worry about. Uh, you mentioned unit testing. Mm -hmm. So some programming languages have a glorious culture of unit testing yes. uh, and a history. Uh, I don't believe R does, I could be wrong. Uh, can you sort of explain to me how you approach unit testing in R? So I think, I think there's sort of a useful parallel between like exploratory data analysis and confirmatory data analysis. So exploratory, you sort of don't have a, a priori a question necessarily or the question's really vague and you have to do sort of a lot of, you know, try a lot of things out and they fail. And whereas confirmatory data analysis, you kind of, you, you know, you have like a hypothesis in mind, you've collected the data for that and now you're going to run a test that you knew in advance you were going to do. And I think there's sort of a similar role in, in, in programming. Like a lot of the programming I do is exploratory. Like I, I don't know how the code should work or how the API should feel. And, and unit testing is basically hopeless for that because it forces you into like a set API and then making changes to that is really hard. Um, so I kind of think of like unit testing as like confirmatory data analysis. So when you know what the result should be a priori, then you, it's really useful to write a test first because you, in an automated way you can um, check it out, check that it works. And I think generally like the way I think of unit testing is that, you know, when you write a function, you test it. Like you try it out with some different inputs. Yeah. Like you don't just write a function and then you're like, well, I did it correctly. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> You run it out, you know, you try it out with a few different inputs. And to me, all unit testing is is making that process formal and automated so you can run it and automatically see whether the results are correct or not. And so like the goal of the test that package, for example, is to make that that shift from informal to formal testing as, as painless as possible. Well, what was the package again? Test that. Test that. I'm unfamiliar with the test that package. It's basically unit testing package okay. for R. Um, so, you know, in, in some, some programming languages, this like discipline of test-driven development is, is very popular. I think that's great if you know what you're going to do, but that's not, a, I don't think that's a great fit most of the time for data analysis or writing data analysis tools because you don't know in advance what the right answer is. That's why it's analysis. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so I, like, unit testing is clearly really important for programming. It seems like maybe there could be some role for unit testing and data analysis too in terms of, like, it seems like it would be n nice to be able to make explicit your expectations of the data so that if those expectations are violated, you find out straight away. Um, and I know... Uh, there's a, a package called test dat um, that was a, a that came out of the R open Sci hackathon earlier in the year that sort of provides some ways I think to, to to make assertions about what you expect your data to, to look like and how it should behave and then if those expectations are violated you find out about it right away cool so R is a programming language mm -hmm. R is a, a, an entire business community mm -hmm. R is also a people community. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any feeling for what the R people community needs to do in order to grow and change? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting how the kind of R people community has changed. Because I, I, I think, like, for a long time, that was basically R help was, like, the main way that R users kind of got together uh, online. But certainly the sort of the, the conventions of our help are not that friendly to newcomers. I was um, warned to stay away from our help when I started my journey. I was explicitly told you're better off not going to our help right now. So I think Stack Overflow has become a great resource, although I think there's a little bit of the same thing going on. Like very early on Stack Overflow was extremely friendly, but now there's like there's a lot of conventions and people like, it just gets, fr it gets frustrating when you see the same question asked over and over and over again, and it seems like the people asking the question have made no effort to find out what the answer is themselves. Um, You'd think there'd be some sort of machine learning model that could find that previous yeah, question. It, it turns out, I think that's a really hard problem, though, because yeah. people, like, express the... And, and, and I think that's something that takes a while like becoming an expert program in many ways is help is part of that is recognizing when two problems that seem quite different are actually the same problem. And certainly like I sometimes look at questions and I'm like it's so obvious to me that this is exactly the same as this other question even though there are like three important details that are, that are different. So it's sort of hard like on Stack Overflow even like 
how, how, what's the generality of a question and when do you say one question is a duplicate of another? That, yeah. that's, I think that's a hard question to, to answer. But certainly like Stack Overflow, I think the, the, the R meetups, mm -hmm. like that's a sort of a fantastic thing that's only happened relatively recently now. If you live in a you know, big city and even a lot of smaller cities, there's someone you, somewhere you can go and hang out with like-minded people and hear about R courses. We have a fantastic R meetup culture here in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. That's really been a lot of what's fostered my development as an R programmer. So you said some really neat things about becoming an expert programmer. Mm -hmm. So if you could go back in time, right, and either give, you know, give yourself some advice early mm -hmm. on in your career as not just a developer, but a developer focused in this space, mm -hmm. is there any particular advice that you'd like to synthesize either to a young you yeah. or to somebody watching this video online who is interested in becoming a data scientist, interested in programming in R, and you want to give them a leg up, a little step forward as what is a bit of advice that, that they should take? So I, th I think the main thing is to understand the value of frustration. Like when you're learning something new, you are going to be frustrated early on. And like that, that's actually really important. Like if you want to get if you want to get physically fit, right, you know like you have to push yourself. Your body is going to say, I am way too tired <laughs> to talk, to do this now. And you have to kind of train yourself to like push past that a little bit further. And every day you push yourself a little bit more than you get fitter. And I think frustration is like the, the equivalent for your brain. Like when you're trying something that's mentally hard, you you get frustrated and you have to recognize that that frustration is actually a good sign. It means you're like pushing your limits. Yeah. And, and so it, it's really natural. And if you're not getting frustrated, I think that that's a bad sign. That means you're not pushing yourself hard enough. So I think that's the, the biggest piece of advice I would give is that you have to expect to be frustrated and that's a good thing. It, you know, it, it's obviously painful, but it's something that everyone experiences that, you know, I have had countless hours of like frustration with R and just banging my head against the wall and that happens to everyone but if you keep doing that if you keep working at it over time it, you get better and you become fluent and, and you become an expert easy growth is not necessarily valuable growth right so for yeah, absolutely frustration is the metric you should measure yep. to a great degree is there anything that I didn't ask you that you'd like to say it's a good question um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess I'd like to, you know, express, so one of the things that I find most satisfying about my job is like hearing from other people about how they're using R and my tools to do stuff. And I just, I absolutely love coming to use R and talking to people and finding out like all sorts of crazy things that they're using R for. And this, this interview, this is really enjoyed this interview. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Cheers.